If you haven't heard about Anger by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anger has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting at Anchor, you can distribute your podcast and listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey everyone, I'm Jim Ambusky and this is Conversations at the Washington Library. You may not know the name Hannah Lauren Shiflin, but after today, you'll know her well. Shiflin was an American poet who rhymed about some of the most important issues facing the early United States in the 18th century, including the British occupation of New York City during the American Revolution, the debate over the gradual abolition of slavery in the early days of the Republic, and the legacy of George Washington. Shiflin sat at the heart of the New York literary scene in these years, but until recently, most of her manuscript poetry remained undigitized and inaccessible to most readers. Thanks to Dr. Kate Tonti and her colleagues at the New York Public Library, now you can read Shiflin's poetry too. Tonti is an expert on early American women's life writing and poetry. She's also the 2021 Omohundro Institute Mount Vernon Digital Collections Fellow, which supported the digitization of Shiflin's poetry. She joins me today to talk about Shiflin's life and the politics of her poetry, especially her poetical confrontation over slavery and Washington's reputation with the mysterious opponent who may not be so mysterious after all. So get your ink and quill at the ready and let's read the political poetry of Hannah Lawrence Shiflin with Dr. Kate Taunty. There are many well-known women authors from the early Republic, the American Revolution. Mercy Otis Warren is one, but Hannah Lawrence Shiflin is one that may not be known to most people. So who is Hannah Lawrence Shiflin? This woman just has the craziest story and how she just was ignored or somehow left behind amidst all this other study of women writing during the revolutionary period and into the early republic. So women like Mer- Mercy Otis Warren or even Anna Spino Stockton, somehow she got left out of the conversation. And it's my goal to bring her back into this conversation because what she does and what she goes through is a little bit different than I would say most Quaker women experienced. So I'll just start sort of from the beginning and give like a little bit of a background about her life and then get into some of the stories that kind of define her as as a lot different than your Mercy Otis Warrens. So she was born in 1758. It's important for her later work that we kind of recognize that that was the same exact year that the Quaker Philadelphia yearly meeting decided to arrange a policy that was basically like, we're going to try to stop using slavery. We're going to try to abandon this in our religious section. And so it's kind of ironic then that at the same time that she's born, this is happening because she's going to have some things to say <laughs> later on. And I'll get to that. But she she's a complicated figure in that sense. But just to go back to where she comes from, her father is John Lawrence. He's a really prominent Quaker merchant. He has some royal patents on Long Island. So they very much think about themselves as British, which a lot of people did right up through the war. She has a sister whose name I'm uncertain of right now. I've been perusing ancestry and all those sites to try to find something. And it's just not, I can't find anything. Her mother is also nameless as of right now (laughs) for me, but she did have a brother, Richard Lawrence, and yearly he died in the epidemic of 1798. And a lot of her poetry are odes and elegies to him. Probably had a really good connection, a really tight relationship. And then she names her son, who's I think it's the oldest son after him. There's not a ton of information about her childhood. I don't have a ton of information about it. I'm sure it exists. What I have right now digitized is mostly her poetry. So my next part of this is going to be getting to her letters. But I do know that around 1780, she marries Jacob Shiflin. And Jacob Shiflin has his own kind of really wacky story too. He is born in 1757. He, in 1776, he's sort of involved in mercantile trade along the Detroit border. Henry Hamilton, who was the governor of the time there, was really impressed with him, and he appointed him lieutenant in the Detroit Volunteers. 
Jacob was eventually taken prisoner of war by the Virginia Rangers under George Rogers Clark, and then he managed to escape. There's no real story behind it. He just got out and he made his way to New York. And within a few months, he had become a popular voice in the Quaker meeting homes. And it seems like he was a Quaker as well. His parents were Dutch, his parents were German. And he just ingratiated himself in that Quaker scene. And immediately, Hannah Lauren Schaeflin was just fell in love with him. Her father was not happy about it. And there's a lot of letters from Hannah kind of saying, you know, if I do this, I'm ruining my reputation. If I do this, my family's going to hate me forever. What should I do? I love this man. And so with some help from her friends, encouragement from her friends, she does decide to marry him. And they run off together to Detroit through Canada. And she doesn't speak to her parents until she is firmly in Ontario, where she writes this really long letter apologizing and telling about her experiences in Ontario. In that letter, we kind of start to see a lot of her, like I said, saltiness. (laughs) She hates the Canadian wilderness. She calls it a terrible (laughs) country. She mentions that other women in her time would rather sleep in a tent than in the 30 French homes <laughs> in the Ontario region. And she's clearly, at that point, we can kind of see her as a clearly upper class civilian. She talks about uh, weeping for her parents' mansion and it, the kind of security in that. But nonetheless, she still talks about how how happy she is and how she doesn't regret leaving with Jacob. There's some other really interesting things in that letter. She describes a lot of encounters with Native American American tribe. She talks about coming upon the Mohawks at some point and not being afraid. She actually says, I'm not, I wasn't afraid to just sit down with them and like essentially hang out. They invited her to come sit with them. And I'm not really sure what prefaced that, how she even came upon it, but she talks about sitting around the fire, just talking with them and then spending a night in a tent not too far off. So she has some kind of liberal leaning ideas, possibly, um, some liberal leaning characteristics. Those will be challenged, though, later on. So we'll get to that. Uh, Before she marries Jacob Shiflin, she is outraged by the British occupation in New York, just so angry about it. And so she decides to write a lot of poetry about it. And one of those poems is something that was called The Mall. And we can talk a little bit about that later when we talk about her poetry. But it was political. And so she would go around New York City passing out these poems and just leaving them in places, leaving them on church doors, handing them out, just kind of leaving them scattered where people could see them. Her pen name was Matilda. Sometimes she used Cornelia, but for the most part, she was Matilda. And um, it's actually really interesting. And somebody decided to send that poem into the New York magazine. It was not her, though, because it came with an anonymous note. The person sending it in said the, they were performances. <laughs> um, the poems were a sort of performance. And uh, they were circulated in manuscript when the British forces held possession, and I happened to pick one up. And so those were published, uh, not by her sending them in, though she did send her own poetry in quite often. I don't know how she managed to stay within the Quaker community. I don't know how they didn't just reject her or disown her in a sense, because she was really sort of breaking that devotion to peace. But I also don't know how she wasn't just, you know, um, hung and (laughs) declared a traitor (laughs) by British forces. I would say some people probably knew who she was, right? People probably recognized her by her pen name, at least a small circle. You know, I think it wasn't as much as anybody would recognize Elizabeth Graham Ferguson as Laura for instance. It wouldn't be that popular, but she would have been recognized by some people. And so she was constantly doing these things that just, and really fiery lines, really fiery sentiment, almost to the extent of threatening. And so she she kind of put herself out in the public without any concern for how people would see her or view her at a point where most Quakers were probably loyalists, even though they would say they weren't, she is very, very much supportive of the Patriot cause, just completely loud about it and not shy about it at all. So that really sets her apart. The irony too is she she marries this British soldier and runs away to Canada with him. So it's it's a real she has a really interesting life story. She writes poetry through her entire life. 
It seems like she had some connections with some of the Philadelphia poets. It seems like she was in touch with some of the Schuyler women. And uh, she definitely had a, a presence for sure. People in Philadelphia at one point knew who she was. So she was getting around. Her name was getting around. Her reputation was getting around. And whether that was in a good or a bad way, I think it depended on who who the person was. I have about 600 <laughs> questions at this point, and I'm not, I'm not even sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. But well, that was a fantastic overview. I mean, that opens up a lot of different avenues we could explore. And my God, yeah. I mean, they both have kind of – she and her husband have both have crazy stories. So yeah, you couldn't make it up. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> let's uh, – I want to put aside her poetry for a second because I do want to talk about that in detail. But I'm I'm curious about her revolutionary activism and then this decision to marry Shiflin, who is a, a soldier, which uh, does seem at odds with the tension in the room, I guess you might say at the moment. But there's also actually in kind of ways it's reflective of her involvement in the gradual abolition debate later, which we'll we'll talk about. But what do you think animates her politics and is driving her to then write poetry, leave it or, you know, give it out, hand it out on the street, whatnot. I know I have this image of my head of, of someone just, you know, some people hand out free hugs these days. She's out there <laughs> handing out free poetry. Yeah. Yeah. I think what motivates her is uh, a very specific incident, and that's the kind of overtake of Trinity Church by British forces. So after that uh, initial fire that ruined part of that church, the British kind of came in and took it over as a, a venue for entertainment. They would have concerts there, and they would kind of stand on the steps and you know harass women who walked by. There's a line in one of her poems about that that says, you know, uh, a woman couldn't even get by without having an essentially what we would call catcalled. So I think that's part of it. I think she felt like her hometown was being trampled upon and ruined. Um, I mean, they were taking apart the the graveyard there. And I think for Shaflin, that was just crossing the line. It doesn't seem like her family really played into the loyalist or patriot side. I think they were kind of neutral and they were out, you know, about protecting themselves. They were really wealthy merchants. So of course they wanted to do whatever they could to keep their money in check. And so I think they just kind of played along with whoever was going into power. So I think what motivated her really was seeing that happening. And you have to remember, she's very dramatic. <laughs> she's a really dramatic person. There is some mention of her. Thank God, because before I, I knew about this book, I could not find a mention of her anywhere. It was almost impossible. And this is in um, Generous Enemies by Judith Van Buskirk. And she calls her the high dramatist of, of romantic poetry, something like that. This, she's she's just oh, the romantic priestess, I think she calls her, <laughs> of poetry, right? So she's very dramatic. Her lines speak to that drama and she just gets fired up really easily and you can see that in her poetry later on as for why she married Jacob Schaeflin or how she even fell in love with him it wasn't completely uncommon for women who were um, either loyalists or patriots or kind of neutral territory to marry British soldiers I mean they were everywhere right so if, if you wanted to get married right? And you knew that your reputation was in marriage if you didn't want to be an unmarried lady who is then kind of looked down upon, you would find somebody even if that person was British. What is different about this particular situation is that most of those other women aren't as forward as Hannah was. They're not as, they're not putting their poetry out there. They're probably not writing poetry. <laughs> um, they're not kind of shouting from the rooftops about this invasion into her, her home territory. So I think that's the difference. I think truly she just fell in love with him. He came in and kind of swept her off her feet. He's described uh, as a very charming man. It would make sense that she was sort of taken by him. I can't help but think, too, there's sort of a rebellion happening here. She's young. She's really young. The way she then talks to her parents about him sounds a little bit rebellious, almost like, and that would be within her character. That would be within her nature, too, from what I can determine. It's important that I think her personality plays, a, I think, played a role in it. Uh, and he had a great story, you know, I mean, he probably impressed her a lot. He was a soldier in the British Army, but by the time that they're married and, and that 
the war is done. It doesn't seem like he is bitter about that. He just, both of them kind of fall in line with the New Republic. And you'll see a lot of her poetry is dedicated to men like George Washington, which we can talk about, uh, Alexander Hamilton. So I don't think they resist it, the new government either. It's really fascinating because it sounds like, and Hannah specifically, and, and maybe her parents too, but they fall into that category that we don't often talk about, which is the group of Americans, colonists, who are simply trying to survive the war and make the best of it in any way that they possibly can, especially, it sounds like they were quite wealthy, so they had considerable interest to think about. They are reminiscent in some ways of uh, Eliza and Samuel Powell down in Philadelphia, who don't really openly declare for one side or the other until you know, the mid middle part of the war. And I mean, I guess I have to ask, what, do we know what the father's objections were? I, I don't have a lot of information about the father's perspective. I know that Buzz Kirk just kind of mentions it in passing that her father was just not happy about it. I don't think it was for religious reasons because he does seem to be a practicing Quaker. It just says that John Lawrence opposed the match, probably because he was a British soldier, I, th- I would think. And also they had this plan to leave New York like immediately. Um, so I, I'm sure he didn't like that either. And again, this drama, um, it, this is from Buzz Kirk's chapter two. She talks about um, how she would write to her letters and say, Matilda is in love. <laughs> so she would call herself by her pen name. And so, yeah, I'm not really sure what the problem was. We just know that he is against it. And of course, I can't find any mention of her mother uh, anywhere. Um, so I'm not sure if maybe she died at some point before this, but there's no uh, mention of if her mother was alive, what she would have thought about it. But I think her sister is supportive in her letter, in Hannah's letter back to her father. She does mention her sister's support for her marriage and then says something to the extent of, um, I hope my sister finds as wonderful a husband as I have, something to that extent. It wasn't uncommon for women to marry British soldiers, but they kind of just got over their political convictions and made it work. But I think also you're you're right. The family is just trying to stay alive at that point, right? Trying to, not to get pulled into it. In a way, it's similar to how, you know, Elizabeth Drinker and other diarists are sort of trying to stay out of it until their husbands are prisoners of war. You know, the difference then is that Shaflin is, is loud about it, whereas they're not. Well, I'm glad she was loud about it because then we get to read all this cool stuff that she writes. <laughs> She's and, and so the- loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh Let's pull back a little bit because we've been talking about Occupy New York. We've been talking about the revolution. Tell us a little bit about the literary scenes in New York and I guess Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the one we always think about as uh, a place where there's literary culture in this period, but clearly there's some stuff happening in New York. So what does this space look like? Right. Well, I don't think it was altogether much different than Philadelphia, right? Both cities recognize that print, especially in the the cases of the new magazine culture, is their way to ensuring sort of a that democratic institution. I will say that maybe the difference um, or the reason that we focus on Philadelphia more is that there just was a bigger population. So there were more people doing that stuff than there might have been in New York, right? By 1776 in Philadelphia, the population was around 40,000, whereas in New York, it was still around 25,000, so half of that. So I think that there's also more Quakers living in Philadelphia at this time. And the Quaker women's scene is huge. People like Milka Martha Moore, whose commonplace book is really famous now, Hannah Griffith, Susanna Wright. Ferguson is not a Quaker, but she still mingles in those literary circles. I think there were just a lot more people to hand off manuscript culture to, right? So, you know, if a poem gets written, right, then it's delivered to so-and-so and and it's delivered to the next person, right? I think there was just bigger circles of people that could be doing this. What is part of my research is to show that this also existed in New York. Hannah Lawrence Schaeflin is at the center of that. I think if Buzz Kirk even says she is in control of it. She has a couple of people who she writes to or writes poems to commonly. They're described in the same ways as Milka Martha Moore's kind of group of women who she um, sends poems to and talks about literature to. But Shaiflin is at the center of that. There's a young man named William Rawls who sort of was in a position where he, as a young man, he just kind of was able to 
frolic around. <laughs> so he he uh, left Philadelphia or his sisters were at and he went to New York just to see what it was like. And he fell in line with these women who were part of this literary circle. And he had a, the best time of his life. He, he just talks about in his letters how uh, taken away he is with these women, uh, specifically this woman named Hannah Lawrence at, the, at that point. They exchange diaries. At one point, um, he gets angry because she loses his diary, <laughs> but they write to each other in their pen names too, which is a little bizarre. And he just talks about how, I mean, you kind of get this impression that he's just in love with her. So you can kind of also get from that part of her character that she is probably very persuasive and just outgoing. So that circle was happening there. In her notes, uh, she left so many detailed notes, which is so lovely. She has a list of the pen names that her friends used. So it's not hard to just go and look and see. Who it's like she a code book. With. It's a code book. Yeah, yeah. She took it really seriously. So I don't think in terms of magazine culture, it's much different. It's just not as big. All right. It's, and I think it's just understudied to a certain extent. The New York Weekly Magazine would be the longest running magazine. You know, so many of these magazines would just fail right after a couple of months. They just couldn't keep up, you know, with um, their membership, their readership versus the expenses of keeping a magazine going. But the New York Weekly, I mean, it it ran for a very long time. And so that kind of shows too, that there is this culture happening in New York, even if it is at a smaller level, or at least a level that we're not recognizing right now, or that we we're kind of so it's, it's kind of, it seems easier to study the Philadelphia literary culture because it was so widely recorded. So my goal is to find more about the New York literary culture and figure out just how much of this I think Shaflin plays at the heart of. Well, it sounds pretty vibrant. And as you were talking about them writing their pen names to each other, I think, didn't Robert Burns and Agnes McElholz do something similar? Yeah, they, they did. Were, they yes. Were, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, William Rawls's, um, I believe it was Horatio, was his pen name. So Matilda and Horatio shared many letters back and forth. And uh, I don't know if there was ever a love connection between them, but he did seem really taken by her to say the least and then he leaves and he goes back to philadelphia he does put her in touch with his sisters uh and i'm not really sure to what it, who his sisters are i need to do more research on that how does shiflin emerge as the center of the new york literary scene I, you gave a fantastic overview of her early life but it sounds like uh, there's a lot still to be uncovered about that yeah you get a sense from her writings and you know both prose and poetry about how she evolved as a writer and then was able to occupy the center of this culture? Yeah. Uh, I think that she just wrote a lot more than everybody else. She just wrote constantly. And I think getting into the concept of her self as a poet, she saw herself as a poet. To her, this wasn't a hobby. And you can very much tell by the way she records her poems, how she sort of organizes them, that she saw herself as this was her her duty. This was her responsibility. So I think that kind of sets her up to be in that spotlight, to be in kind of control of that circle. And all of this is happening um, before she's married to Shiflin. So this is happening in her like late teens, early 20s. Wow. Yeah. And by the time she has this circle, uh, she's in, at least in her early 20s. So a lot of this was taking place earlier in her life. You can see that her poetry gets a little less dramatic as she gets older. These early poems are mostly political in nature, and I could talk a little bit about one of them specifically. But her later ones are more focused in legacy, more focused in family, more focused in kind of seeing her role as similar to a historian, I think. She saw the poet as just as much an influence to preserving history or, or re creating a legacy from this period as a historian would have. Her mind changes on that after some a series of offense. But when she's younger, I think she definitely sees herself as a poet, as also a recorder, like a storyteller. 
she's not holding back as say I am a poet at some point she calls herself the poetess so you know she definitely saw that as her job essentially and she always made really detailed notes about where she was sending the poetry to uh, at the top of most of her poems it'll say for the New York Weekly or for the Time and Literary Peace Companion so she already has an idea in her head when she begins to write this poetry that she will send it somewhere it's not by accident most of it's not by accident whereas a lot of the Philadelphia Quaker women I'm sure they published knowingly but they were also in a position where somebody would get a hold of their poetry and send it in without their permission that kind of thing but Shiflin is different in how she's she sees herself as a poet that's her occupation tell us a little bit about that political poetry you just mentioned yes yeah there's a lot of it i think the most intriguing of it is is really the one that i mentioned it's, it's called the mall and in her notebook it's originally actually titled something different it's titled is a little bit longer it's on the purpose to which the avenue adjoining trinity church as of late has been dedicated 1779 but it's published as just the mall and it looks like somebody in her notebook, like if her notebook was passed down to a family member, maybe, because it's not in her writing. On the back of the page where the poem ends, somebody scribbled The Mall by Mrs. Uh, Hannah Lawrence Shiflin. It's definitely not her handwriting. So I don't know at what point that turned into The Mall, but her original title for it was this long title of On the Purpose of this avenue adjoining trinity church so that poem is is really fiery can we get a little bit of a flavor with that yes yes we can so the the mall is a, a really unique situation as i was saying earlier there is a, a print copy of this just like old printed versions of the new york weekly magazine that you can just get on any kind of american periodicals database and the beginning of this is that note from the anonymous person and it says the following juvenile performances so again he's talking about her poetry as a performance rather than just a poem which i thought really spoke to her character uh were circulated a manuscript during the late revolution when the british forces held position of the city in consequence of the improper resort to the walk in front of trinity church and then he says, you know, if you think these are amusing, he says, then they are at your service. So she starts them all with, this is the scene of gay resort. Here, feist and folly hold their court. Here, all the martial band parade to vanquish from unguarded maid. Here, ambles many a dauntless chief who can, O oh great beyond relief, who can, as sage historians say, defeat whose bottles in array. So essentially she's saying that we can get rid of these guys, <laughs> that this, this scene of gay resort doesn't belong here. It gets a little bit more feverish toward the end. She says, oh, and then like an ex exclamation mark, arm to vengeance, arm the skies. Oh, rife for no degenerate sun bids impious blood the guilt atone by thunder from ethereal plains. Avenge! <laughs> Your old, I think it says your own uh, dishonored, uh, I can't really make out that word there, but essentially dishonored ground. Bid guardian lightnings flash around and vindicate the hollowed ground. So she's essentially saying, I hope they get hit by lightning. I hope they get set on fire. And then she takes a more satirical turn. She writes them all. And then she writes this recantation. And obviously we know that word recantation as, you know, recanting your opinion on something. Doesn't seem like she's doing that here. I think she's using the recantation as a satirical device because most of this poem, which is separate from the mall, is sort of, I think it's speaking against people who are telling her she's too dramatic or trying to convince her to write happier poetry, right? I can imagine that as a woman, people would say to her, you should be writing about happier things. You should write, be writing about your friends and you should be writing about, you know, what kind of, you know, domestic work you do. You should be writing about God. It's like the 18th century equivalent of you should smile more. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. So I think she's being sarcastic here. She says in the beginning, had I the muse of satire's warmest rage to bring and the vices of an impious age to snatch the villain from his happiest lot in calm oblivion to remain forgot. Uh, and then she goes on to talking about the unmeaning raving of fairy rhymes. <laughs> um, she even says she's making fun of the British soldiers themselves saying, oh, well, I guess we should kind of
kind of look at them as though they're they're these beautiful beings. He she even makes mention of their horses. She says, next, sing the trim, well-powdered warrior's course. <laughs> Recount the gorgeous trappings of his horse. Uh, how the broad umbrange intercepts soul's rays to shade his beauties. Uh, and then the rest of that's a little hard to make out. But far from the fields, he dare to run. Uh, and then she kind of goes into talking about, again, how this hollow ground is, is being treaded upon, right? And that there is a reason to talk about this and that there is a reason that this is important. Now, the funnier thing is that somebody writes back to her and she got this a lot. I think she calls a lot of outrage with her poetry. Uh, And this short little poem just says to Matilda and it says, Matilda, stop thy course of virtuous rage (laughs) and spare from satire this unthankless age um so this person is kind of saying could you know we're already in a difficult place could you just spare us the drama (laughs) and that's just anonymous um actually it's the it's signed uh with an r and then um a couple of uh stars after that so it could the number of stars after that does it could set uh spell out raw uh, i i wonder i can't help but wonder if it is her friend william rawls responding well kate one of the cool things you've been working on recently is working with the new york public library to actually digitize a lot of her manuscript poetry and whatnot can you tell us a little bit about that exciting work and then let's dive into another thorny subject that she sticks her poetry into, which was is the gradual abolition debate. <laughs> yeah, this is where I get things get bad. Yeah. So I, you know, I was working on my dissertation. My dissertation was on women's revolutionary women's diaries and commonplace books and letters. So all kind of life writing things. So in 2018, I was at the New York Public Library and I just came upon by happenstance this folder. And I thought what what drew my attention is that she had her own folder. Her stuff wasn't just kind of placed between her husband's writings or her brother, or her father's writings. There was a whole couple of folders dedicated to just her. So that drew my attention. And I started looking through them and I was like, wow, I've never heard of this person before. And then that's when I saw the Omahandro uh, Institute's Mount Vernon Digital Fellowship. So I applied to that and to my surprise, got it. So all that money went to the New York Public Library in digitizing over a couple of months, these poems. It really has helped a lot. It's accessible. Um, I've put the link everywhere and I'm hoping people take the time to go in. You can read it as a book, which is wonderful. So you can flip through the pages really easily. The other thing about Shiflin's poetry is that it's really clear. Her handwriting is just beautiful. So it's not hard to see what she's saying. It's really, it's actually pretty simple to transcribe. Once that was all digitized, I decided I wanted to make an Omeka page out of it. I just wanted to focus on this one particular point in her life, which we're going to get to in a minute. Because she has such a history, you would really need a full edited digital edition to really speak to everything. So I thought the Omeka part really just helped to talk about this particular instance in her life. We'll certainly post the links to both the digitized images at New York Public Library and your Omeka site. I've thumbed through the manuscripts themselves digitally, of course, and it's great. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of early American poetry. I've tried to use it as much as I can in my work where appropriate because it's always a fascinating insight to how people are thinking about politics and uh, other issues in different ways. But it's, uh, there's, a, there's a heck of a lot of stuff to go through. Like It's a yes. tremendous... And not tooting our own horn here because Mount Vernon helps, you know, supply some of the funding. But like if there were a lot of things that needed to be digitized and that was one of them. So that's it's fantastic. What is digitized is this sort of just not even all of the tip it. of the iceberg, really. The right? iceberg. Her letters, the letters are still there. I want to read through her husband's letters. I want to read through his. Uh, he was, he ended up, once they came back to New York after kind of taking that detour through Canada and to Detroit, he was a merchant too and he started a pharmacy. And so I want to get to looking at his letters and kind of thinking about what business he did as well, just to get a, a better idea of what kind of people they were in this moment and how, and, and to see 
see also if his, I mean, it's, it, he doesn't seem, like I said earlier, he doesn't seem to reject or be uh, bitter toward uh, the new government. But I would hope to find something that speaks to it or maybe even speaks to his wife's, <laughs> to, to <laughs> Hannah's perspective of this. Because he's, a, I mean, he married her. He clearly knew who she was. So I'd love to see what his perspective on her is. That's fantastic. Well, let's let's get into the sticky subject we were kind of referencing here a moment ago, because this involves a gentleman named George Washington as well. And that's the gradual abolition debate in which Shiflin injects herself poetically and politically. And it's a fascinating look at the tension over this entire debate. Yeah. Okay. So this all starts with Edward Rushton. And Edward Rushton was an abolitionist. Uh, He was a poet. He not only believed in abolition, but he said, we also need to provide education and opportunities for previously enslaved, now free peoples. He was very influential in the Quaker community, definitely one of those loud voices. So she would have known who he was. And the way she writes her response to him, and I'll get to that in a minute, definitely suggests she knew him. If not personally, she definitely felt like she knew him. The thing about Edward Rushton is he writes this letter to Washington, and he kind, he just, he's very harsh on Washington, and he he sort of contradicts, or he sort of challenges, I should say, George Washington's position of power. The most, I think, damning part of the letter is this one, and I'll I'll read it to you. It says, it is not to the commander in chief of the American forces, nor to the president of the United States that I have ought to address. My business is with George Washington of Mount Vernon in Virginia, a man who notwithstanding his hatred of oppression and ardent love of liberty holds at this moment hundreds of his fellow beings in a state of abject bondage. Yes, you who conquered under the banners of freedom, you are not the first magistrate of a free people, are strange to relate a slaveholder. That is what brings Shiflin into this. So she presumably reads this letter. This is around 1797 in February. So by May 29th in 1797, the Time and Literary Peace Companion publishes her response, which is a vindication to Edward Rushton. And it begins good enough. Uh, It begins kind of with just addressing him and asking him, how could you do this, right? How could you belittle the name of this man who has done so much for this country? She even says, uh, there's a couple of lines here, I'll read it, just the first in virtue, talent, and in fame, to whom heaven gave for might deeds designed, the firm, enlightened, comprehensive mind, the heart to purpose, and the soul to scan, and all the noblest energies of man. So in those lines, she's talking about Washington. And she says, Later, what could inspire thy sacrilegious pen? (laughs) This is the part where it kind of sounds like maybe she she knew him personally. She says, oh, Rushton, to the fame the first of men. And couldst thou dream that thy advice should sway the mind which millions glory to obey? I love that line because she's essentially saying you're not as good as George Washington. So (laughs) you're not going to be remembered for this. You don't have any right to write this. Then the problem is, the problem arises where she starts to get to the end of the poem. She gets, you can see possibly where she's, it would be possible to see her as a proponent of slavery. Because most of the poem is about just loyalty to Washington. And then all of a sudden, she says, um, and these are the lines that I have a lot of difficulty dealing with and and trying to understand. Um, Because she says, grant the event, succeed thy favorite theme. So let's let's imagine, right, that this actually happens. Incautious justice should complete thy scheme. Fly helpless whites to dens and sheltering caves. Fly from the vengeance and the wants of slaves. Freed from restraints, a rude unlettered band. Start into force and desolate the land. Prone to each vice that slavery inspires, fixed indolence and uncontrolled desires. Fly helpless whites to woods and sheltering caves, or toil to feed emancipated slaves. When I got to that line, (laughs) I was a little bit uncertain if I wanted to 
proceed with studying her. The New York Public Library's description or biography of her calls her anti-slavery, calls her an abolitionist. So when I got to that line, I said, no, she's not completely anti-slavery, not to the extent that Edward Rushton and other Quakers might have been. And of course, it wasn't completely uncommon for Quakers to be sort of in between on this subject. There were several meeting houses that just didn't obey the Quakers' resolve to abolition and not owning slaves. So at this point, though, it's it's not completely unusual or unheard of. Not all Quakers are, are abolitionists. Um, we, I think we make that assumption. They just weren't. They were divided on this issue. As you were reading them, they were very reminiscent of stuff that Thomas Jefferson writes in uh, Notes of the State of Virginia or in what he says in other writings, right? If, if we are to have immediate emancipation, there will be a race war and the land will be deluged in blood. And it's fascinating to see that perspective pop up in her poetry. Yeah, I think we'll get to this in a little bit of her later poetry and talking about how she is trying to understand what George Washington's legacy will be. I think she's really torn, right? She's torn between wanting to be loyal to this new government. She's kind of taken aback and just completely indulgent in these ideas of George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. She never writes anything to Thomas Jefferson, but um, she's just, uh, yeah, <laughs> she's just enmeshed in this, right? She's feeling the patriotism. She's feeling this devotion to Washington. Um, and a lot of women wrote, I mean, you could probably call it a genre of poetry, it's George Washington poetry, but she's very much uh, devoted to these men. And I think that, that those lines are her trying to figure out right where she stands right here. How can you be devoted to this country that is also in, at the foundation? Um, these men are still enslaving people. And I think she's having a really hard time trying to figure that out, right? How can you justify the idea that this land is built on freedom, that this country is built on freedom while this is also happening. So her later poetry is going to show that she's a little bit torn by this. In this particular poem, I think, again, she's rushing headfirst into the drama of it without thinking about it, right? She's just kind of angry at Edward Washington. She wants very much to defend Washington. Toward the end of the poem, she comes back to the issue of Washington. She abandons the slavery issue really quickly after those lines. And she kind of decides she's going to take on <laughs> the, the fight. And she says, and zeal for candor's violated laws, fearless I venture forth and lead the van to vindicate from blame the glorious man. Though well I know fate's universe decree, no mortal word shall live from censure free and only to the unconscious silent dust is fame proprietus and mankind is just so this line about i will lead <laughs> i will lead the the pack to defend this person to the death is kind of again kind of reminiscent of her dramatic romanticized lines that she's writing you think if she was writing that piece and she started down that track about it seemingly defending slavery that she suddenly realizes uh wait a second Maybe I should sift gears and get back into Washington because I may have gone too far. I think so. I think so. Because th those are the only lines that really speak to it. There are a couple of lines, though, um, that speak to her. She, she's essentially saying, well, you can't blame him right? You have to blame the people that came before him. He's, you know, he has enslaved peoples because this has become a sort of uh, just expectation. And this is a very misguided opinion, obviously. But she says to Rushton, if you're going to blame him, if you're going to attack him for it, then you need to attack every single other person that owns a slave in this country, right? You have to write letters to them too. You have to call them out too, because otherwise you're just defaming Washington for the sake of defaming Washington, which of course is, like I said, that's a very misguided view. <laughs> uh, not every single one of those people are the president of the United States, but that's the way she sort of sees it. And then again, she, then she comes back to this defense of Washington, but she's going to get called out pretty quickly. On June 7th, 1797 is a poem that appears in the same uh, magazine, The Time and Literary Peace Companion. And it's signed by somebody that just signs it, The Slave. I've been trying to figure out who that is. And there's a lot of different columns all over the place, sign the slave. So that's gonna, it's going to take me a while. But it's just titled to Matilda. And it just kind of rips her apart and says, no, you're wrong, right? Washington's like, and again, this is really speaking to Washington's legacy 
legacy more than it is to slavery. He's saying Washington's legacy is is going to be corrupted by slavery, right? You can't ignore that. And then he accuses her of, of this declaration of pro-slavery sentiment. And part of the beginning of uh, that poem says, ah, songstress, had his fout ever felt what twas to labor, pant and melt beneath the torrid solar ray and wear in anguish life away. Oh, hadst thou known the tyrant's lash, or seen the wide and sanguished gash? Oh, heard the shrieks of agony, then thou wouldst not plead for slavery. He goes on to critique her presumption of whites having needed to flee, uh, or, or having been being attacked, or having to live in caves. He just kind of says that that's absurd, that's ridiculous. But he also, whoever this person is, also he says, "Thou, I, I with thee, fair muse, revere." So he's saying, "I, I do revere you. The hero to Columbia is dear to us." So he's not saying that George Washington is a bad guy necessarily. He's just saying that the legacy is going to be tarnished by slavery. He does say at the end, he says, this is this is going to hurt him. But he's sort of getting into this place where he wants to kindly settle the argument with Matilda, with Shiflin, and sort of commenting that one of the tenets that was essential to the success of the New Republic is this right to free speech. Right, and that applies to everybody. And he ends the poem with, Thou the world hath joined to praise the actions of his numerous days. And so essentially, yeah, we, we should praise Washington for his accomplishments. But then it turns, yet <laughs> virtue, when she crowns his grave, shall weep that he ever owned a slave. And fame regretfully complain that on his glory rests one stain. So this poem is not necessarily calling out George Washington the way that the Edward Rushton letter was, but it's certainly asking Matilda to, or asking Shiflin to, to self-reflect <laughs> on what she believes it will be Washington's legacy. Then she prints and publishes a poem to uh, rebuke the slave called On the Necessity of Gradual Abolition of Slavery. And it's addressed to the slave. And she tries to mend <laughs> what she said. She's going on about how it's despicable that this exists. This is not within God's plans for humanity that there are many evils that exist in the world, and this is definitely one of them. Shaflin, she tries to convince the readers that she views all people as God's children, regardless of race. She recognizes that slavery is not a Christian mindset. In one of the verses, she says, to Afric's wretched sons, we still allow a painful, sad preeminence and woe. And sure with thee, I reprobate the plan that made mankind the property of man. So she's really trying to reestablish herself as a, an abolitionist to ex the extent that you could call her that. But the last stanza returns again to Washington's legacy. She says, indulge the patriots and poets flame, but spare in gratitude that honored name, nor make the hero by reproach atone his predecessor's errors, not his own. So again, trying desperately to see the separate layers of Washington and trying to ignore what she knows is not the good parts of him. And then the slave writes her back and says, you're still wrong, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> uh, and that's where the debate ends. It just kind of, uh, you know, flourishes. there's a couple of more responses to Matilda that are a little bit harsher, um, really calling her out, calling her pro-slavery. How can you? You're a monster. All these things. Those are shorter. But getting into this debate then leads her into reconsidering how Washington's legacy will be remembered. One of the really interesting things in your digital exhibit where you lay out this debate is right at the very end where you're talking about the rebuttals from the slave and raising the possibility that this might actually be Shiflin herself. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Potentially, one, that's a really smart PR move. But then two, like very clearly wrestling with these questions, as you say, self-reflection, and she's doing it potentially in both avenues. Yeah. So the thing about Shiflin is she leaves more mysteries. The more and more that you study her and the more you think you understand her, she does something mysterious that makes you go, okay, maybe I need to start from the beginning and try to reevaluate everything. And this is one of the mysteries that she leaves us in. The reason I suggest that is for two reasons. In her notebooks, she has written down her response to Edward Rushton. And she has at the top of it, 
usually what she would write if she was submitting something to a, a, a publication. So it just says for the time and literary piece companion, this title sent on this date. And then she does the same for on the necessity of gradual abolition of slavery to the slave. She has these pieces back to back. So it starts with the vindication that ends. And then on that next page, she starts with for the time and literary piece companion to Matilda. So she's doing the same thing that she does with all of her poetry that she submits. The other thing is the lines are also really fiery, are sort of similar to the language she uses. There's not a lot of difference in the fiery tone. And so that's the other thing that kind of compels me to wonder if she's she is doing this back and forth on purpose. Also, the dates are really, really close together. So May 29, 1797, immediately followed by June 7, 1797. I wonder, you know, how long would it take to to print something like this, get it distributed? I mean, I guess it's possible that somebody would have found it and, and been able to write this response in that amount of time, but it seems like they're really, really close together as though she were purposely staging this out. The other thing is at the top of the magazine where this is published, it says to Matilda, CRs of last Monday, which it's, which kind of sounds to me as though they knew it was like a series almost right, that they were seeing it as a series. So I, I have to wonder if it's really actually just her. And if it is her, <laughs> that just raises so many more questions and um, and also speaks to her immense talent as a poet, too. More conversations after the break. Want to dive deeper into Shiflin's poetry? Be sure to check out the show notes for today's episode for links to her digitized manuscript collections held by the New York Public Library and Dr. Tonti's digital exhibit on Shiflin and the gradual abolition debate. And now. Back to the show. Kate, what book are you reading right now? Right now is actually not anything related to anything that I study. I'm actually reading uh, for a cloud teaching. I somehow got charged with teaching science fiction this semester, and I, I don't know how that happened, but um, I mean, I like Star Trek, so maybe that was enough. So I'm reading Louise Erdrex, I think is you pronounce her last name, uh, The Future Home of the Living God which is a sort of indigenous take on dystopia. But in terms of scholarly stuff I'm reading, I'm still working my way through Generous Enemies by Buzzkirk. I look forward to reading um, some of the new things that have come out about Native American studies. Our beloved Kin is on my list um, that I'm really trying to find time to get to. Who is the author you most admire? Oh, gosh. Um, I think in my field, I mean, this is a common answer, but I'm always amazed by Laura Thatcher Ulrich. I love A uh, Midwife's Tale. I love her book, Good Wives, which is one of the ones that I, as an undergrad, I just devoured um, and really uh but gosh, I have to know more about this. You know, I just want to know more about this. So I think her, but I also love uh, Caroline Wigington. And then I'm also really interested in some of the things that my mentor and friend, Mary Balkin, is doing with digital humanity stuff. So I've been reading up on some of the things she's doing uh, in her, her area there, some of the presentations and articles she's made using early American studies with digital humanities projects. We've spent a lot of time talking about documents today. So this may be a little tricky, but what is the most exciting document you've ever found? It has to be one of these poems. There's this one that keeps challenging me. Um, and it's this tiny little poem. Some of her stuff was just scribbled on tiny little bits of fragments. It's to Alexander Hamilton, but the way that she writes it, it almost makes it look as though she's copying the lines of something Alexander Hamilton wrote. And I have to, I, I cannot figure that out. Um, it's, it's sort of vague in nature. And the lines are kind of weird too. She has a couple of poems to him. And this one is just escaping me because it's so different than the other ones. So I can't help but wonder if she's just copying lines that she received somehow from him or from maybe one of his family members. Um, so I'm still looking into that. So I don't know if that's the most exciting, but that's definitely the most confusing right now. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the sometimes those are the most exciting, and the hunt continues. Yeah, yeah. I think I was really excited when I found these back-to-back -back poems uh, in her her notebook, and that kind of gave me what I started to suspect is that she might have been writing both perspectives. 
Finally, how do you hope people remember your work? I just hope that hopefully with this project and the amount of work I'm putting into it and just my love for this woman at this point, I'm hoping that she just becomes part of the conversation that already is uh, happening about these amazing women who existed. And I hope she complicates that conversation. I hope that this gradual abolition debate that she's part of complicates it enough to, you know, we're always looking for people who we want to see as perfect, right? We want to always see the subjects that we study as not being the stereotypical early American who, you know, we perceive as, as um, just not being as informed about uh, equity and uh, diversity as we are and not to defend her. At, at all, but to suggest and to show that she really was kind of living in this liminal space and not being sure what to make of it herself is really important to that history, especially to the history of how, you know, abolition becomes involved in some of the uh, women's suffragist movements. You can't separate abolitionists from white supremacists necessarily, or, or not necessarily white supremacists, but just this general nature of not thinking that enslaved people had any rights, right? They could be abolitionists, but also harbor those thoughts that, so it's complicated. And I just hope that whatever happens with this, whether I, I think I want to try to publish an article on her, which I'm working on right now, I would love to have an edition of this made into a book, edition of her poetry. So I just hope whatever comes of this is something that complicates the way that we see Quakers and complicates the way that we see women poets in this particular period. Kate, thank you very much. This has been great. Thank you. I, I was so excited to do this. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Conversations, a production of the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library. I'm Jim Ambusky, your host and producer for this episode. We received additional support from Mount Vernon's Media and Communications Department. Our music is Witches Brew by C.K. Martin. Before we go, please do us a favor and rate and review Conversations on your favorite podcast app. It helps others find the show and lets us know what you're learning about our early American past. And be sure to head over to our website at www.georgewashingtonpodcast.com to find more great episodes. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.